And we're back. What's happening, everybody? Uh, in all these crazy times, we are going to be focusing on uh, the good old trusty DFS world. We're, I'm going to lose myself in this stuff. I can already feel it. I'm just getting into MMA for the first time, my, my first real full slate that I'm going to be playing. And uh, we got Sheets here to help me break it down. And he's been doing some of this stuff. And I've been doing some research. And there's a lot of ways you can win without being knowing the most about a sport. It happens all the time. Um, this is what I'm hoping carries over for me in MMA. Sheets, uh, what are your initial thoughts? Sort so, of so let me tell you what's going on tomorrow. So I'm going to tell you what's going on tomorrow, just to give you a little preview, if anybody's interested in this. So there is MMA. There are, there are two NASCAR slates, Infinity and the Truck Series. And then there's Sunday, there's a NASCAR main event. Not to mention incredible amount of horse racing tomorrow. Um, there, there, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And, and if I'm, if I'm in the mood in the morning tomorrow, I'll put, I'll put something on a horse racing. Maybe I'll put something on, on the way I do the infinity and the NASCAR stuff. Cause I'm, I, again, this is, this is what I think you guys want to see in that is actually how people create lineups, how they go through their thought process. And, and I have no problem with full transparency, exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. And you'll be able to see that even though I might not know, you know, as much of the intricacies, I'm certainly going to show you how I'm making my lineups and just my thought process. And we'll just kind of see where it goes. Can I tell you one thing? I don't want to say I'm frustrated with, but it's maybe it's been like this in every sport, but um, I noticed it more in MMA. So I watched, pretty much every bit of content that my brain could, could, could absorb. Okay. All the big, all the big providers, all the little, anybody that I could that felt as though I could listen to, I listened to and I absorbed everything. And let me tell you something. I don't know whether people are just kind of gun shy or, or, or their, their whims from DFS. Let, let me tell you what I've been unable to find. I've been unable to find anybody that can take a stand on freaking anybody. Right. I mean, every single person is like, well, maybe I'll have some interest in this guy. Ooh, but maybe this guy's all right. Oh, I can see where this guy is, Ooh, but maybe this guy's got a shot. I like this, but maybe I'll certainly have some shares of this. I'm like, listen, okay, may maybe MMA is just different than other sports, but I doubt it. I mean, I, I still think that it comes down to you have to take stands, you have to have an opinion, and you just can't, what do you say? can't like dean it up or whatever you can't, yeah. you can't you can't just play everybody you know now now i guess you could if you were really really technical about who you're pairing with and different correlations and and, and things like that but maybe people are just kind of nervous that like back to dfs and i don't want to come off as a content guy you know laying myself out on the line and then just like have people yell at me like people have been doing on twitter and stuff but that's not very genuine you know so so you're just going to have to find people that, you know, you're, you can fade and you can have to find people that, you know, that you can go overweight on or that you can even take a, you know, lock in or whatever it is, especially like in a, in a, in a slate like this. So I don't want to say false advertising, but, you know, misleading advertising is that saying it's a, you know, millionaire maker, right? That it's, it's a million dollars for first on the DraftKings slate. But the fact of the matter is, is that ain't nobody winning a million dollars in this tournament, okay? There's, with, with only, whatever, 12 fights, 24 betting interests, I just don't find it very plausible. What, that, if, what if Wineland and Spencer both win and you need them and their opponents? That's the kind of thing right. you win with, you know what I mean? Something right. like that, right? So, so what, do you, what do you think about this in general? Because, I mean, you've played millie makers in football. You've played all these types of things. And I used to ask you this a lot. Um, I used to ask you, which is usually the bigger mistake? Is it playing the too chalky guy um, or is it playing the guy that has no, ch no chance, right? And it's a, a very interesting, interesting question. You know, it, when, when you're playing baseball or basketball or football, is the fishier play to play a guy who's probably a good play but it's going to be too popular or is the fishier play just to, in the name of trying to be too different, just just blowing up and playing someone that has no chance right and I, I don't i don't really know the answer but i almost wonder if if on a slate like this 
you're going to get a lot of dead money lineups that are just really just shooting to be unique. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and then may, maybe it's better. I don't want to say be too chalky, but maybe it's better to not worry as much about it. So I this don't know. is not what we focus on, but this is a good a good argument for why this would be a good cash game slate then. Right. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and and maybe. from what I've from, from, from um, the people I've talked to the last week's MMA slate, they would or last MMA slate, they, they would consider a, a poor cash slate, a good tournament slate, and this would be a much stronger tur- uh, cash slate according to them. Um, but what's interesting though is when you have such obvious ownership and just from an outsider's perspective, you look at some of these guys and I'm, I'm listening to everybody talk about them. And while Wineland, you know, may not be able to beat O'Malley, there's certainly enough people who think he can battle long enough that, I mean, that immediately play, make it a play at a guy who's going to be less than 10% owned. If you're going to own 25% of them, let's say, and pretty much from what I've heard throughout some of the other experts is that taking some stances on, you know, playing some Wineland and Spencer lineups that yes, they probably aren't going to get to get you there and not, you, you don't need them to win is the other thing that I don't, I didn't know on how, to what extent that was true. It's so true in this. And I didn't realize how much until I really started digging in. Is that really true? I mean, you, you can, you can get away with almost like a loss and still, uh, depending on how it goes or at least you know if it, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it, the rat, uh, fight goes a little longer you know some of these fights are supposed to end quickly which is why the ownership is so slanted so like one of the my first initial things just from the people I talked to and again maybe I'm crazy for this is to not play hardly any of a guy like O'Malley um, to play to get to get a good amount of ownership on Wineland and it is a just in case thing but I'm playing tournaments I'm trying to win and I need to differentiate and I everybody else I, I talk to there's a lot there's there's other guys who seem to be stronger even though the odds may not say so it's at least stronger to put up a better a better score at a similar price like Menafield is a guy who I have I'm probably gonna have in almost every tournament I'll have zero of Clark because of that reason um that's sort of what I'm focusing on now Menafield is going to be owned but he's not going to be owned quite as much as the O'Malley Nunez you know people um and Anyway, keep go ahead. Chief. Yeah. So, so what I was what I was going to say is that, um, um, and I ask you this, and this this applies to to other sports too. Is if you don't like, I don't want to say if you don't like a player, but if there's someone's like really really chalky, is the best way to um, to address that is to just play somebody else in the price range, or and or is it better to play just the the negative correlation with that player you know what i mean like if if there's a a pitcher for example who's like really really chalky is it is it better to get i mean there are two ways to do it. is it better to get leverage just by taking another pitcher or is it better to get like double leverage i guess by by playing the hitters against them right, right. um and so like when i think about it like same like you take like nunez for for example can i jump in on that main point real quick i yeah, want go to go for it that, but on that main point, I really think it depends on which sport. And in this sport, I think it's very different than in baseball. Well, I agree that stacking against a pitcher that's popular is always a great way to leverage. It doesn't necessarily mean it's an optimal play. Whereas here, if you're not going to bet on the, the person who's the most likely, certainly taking some shots on their opponent as long as anybody thinks they can, they, they have even a one in 10 chance to win. Because then all of a sudden, you're not only avoiding a guy who's going to be half owned by half the field, all of a sudden, you're, you're now owning a guy who's going to be owned by, let's say, 5% of the field. And it doesn't mean – and not all of those 5% won't have the other guy, by the way. There will be people who play people against each other in matchups in certain situations, and this might be one of them. Um, anyway, that, that, I just wanted to say that it's, I think it's different. I think you do want to make that more – from my limited knowledge from who I've talked to, I, I would think it would be more important to leverage in a, in a fight, in a, in a situation like this, because of the lack of other options than it would be on a, against a pitcher in a baseball slate. It's interesting. So, so the first, the first thing I did is, is not the first thing I did, but one of the main things I did, I did, I did go to the betting odds. And the first thing that I did when I looked at the betting odds was not the, um, not the win odds, which I think are important, but the right. first thing I looked at is which fights had a, uh, a total rounds of, uh, of one and a half or less, as opposed to the ones that maybe are two and a half or less, because when you're playing, you know, when you're playing, uh, you know, MMA, you want the early round knockouts, right? And you want, the, you want that. So the, the, the one, two, three, um, four fights that, uh, which are four fights that, that characterize that of the Nunez fight, the O'Malley fight, the Bird fight, and the Menafield fight, right? So you think that those are the four, you know, 
fights where I would imagine they were gonna they'd get owned, but you know what? Maybe for maybe for decent reason, especially with the one and a half rounds. So the first thing I did is if I were going to prioritize those, I would just think of which of those four situations would be the least owned, right? So, so I don't know, for me, again, I don't know these guys are really much from a hole in the wall, but from what I heard from a lot of people, I heard a lot of, you know, Nunez is just kind of a lock and she's the, the greatest whatever. And it makes sense. And then O'Malley too. And, and then many people, I did hear some like Clark steam. So maybe I, I'm kind of getting into, if I was going to just pick one guy to the really lock in sort of, I think it would be Bird. Um just because, again, I think of those four fights, those four people I mentioned, he might be the less owned of them all. Yeah. So maybe that's, that's, that's a way to attack this is to pick one, make sure you pick, you know, you don't play, th- I mean, if you, if you play three of them even, but maybe pick only, maybe make sure you only play two of these guys. You know what I mean? Um, but I think Bird, pro- uh, that's the way I'm going to do it. If Bird is probably my favorite guy to play because he, he rates to finish a fight early, you know, earlier than most. And he's probably the least popular of the four. That, that's, that was the, my first take. The second thing that I came up with was this is based on what you just said. I mean, we talk about trying to leverage and try to just take shots and, and whatever is one thing I did hear pretty much across the board in about the Nunez thing is the, really the only thing I know about Nunez, it, my own, is that she beat Ronda, Ronda Rousey. I, that's really all I know. I'm one of those fish that, like, I know Ronda Rousey, and um, now I can't even think of the guy's name. Who's 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 the guy, the, the Irish guy? Conor McGregor, right? All I know is Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey and nobody else, right? So so I remember that, and, and, and Holly Holm, because she beat Ronda Rousey. I was one of those people that just knew Ronda Rousey. So I know that Nunez is supposed to be the be, 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 Oh, Okay. So I suppose that Nunez is supposedly the not. She's the greatest of all time. Okay, fair enough. But one thing I did hear throughout is two things. Number one is that she may actually have cardio issues, meaning that if it go the longer it goes, yep. the, the more chance he has of maybe getting tired. And the second thing that I heard is that that for whatever it's worth, Spencer gets a lot of her 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 juice out of out of uh, out of submissions. Yep. So, and that's what's kind of weird about about MMA as a sport and kind of cool is, you know, you're, you're, you can watch some fight and somebody can be kicking the crap out of somebody and then just one little reversal and you get the guy in a toe lock or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And, and, and the game, and it's just over, you know, and, and, and you can just feel it's, it's like so tilting in a way because I had this, this guy the other week who was just burying somebody. And then next thing you know, the guy got him in this, you know, this in, in one of those submission holds and he just, the, the rest of the fight didn't even matter. So I, I actually wouldn't have a problem with, with, with playing some Spencer, um, especially in this type of format when you want to differentiate. Because, again, it satisfies everything that we talked about. It talked about, you know, leverage. It talks about not playing all the highest owned people. And I'll tell you this, for however popular you think Nunez is going to be, I think that she's even going to be more popular just because, again, the combination of her being a really good play um, about, among the experts mm-hmm. and, and – just casuals just piling on also. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that maybe she's gonna be more popular than, than whatever. So so you're the, the guy you brought up, um I, I'm looking for a second guy like that. So so you like you like Menafield as um as somebody like that to kind of key into, right? Yeah, Menafield's the one I'll have the nearest uh, the closest to me you're locking in, just based on everybody I listen to and all the stuff I could come across. I, I had the best feeling of him being the least risky for the best uh, ownership. Like you mentioned, Bird would be another guy who I considered like that. But Menafield, I just decided to t- pretty much take a, a stand and have him in about three quarters of the tournaments I play. And I agree that I do think that, that uh, well, I think that uh, you're going to see even higher ownership on, like, let the, like you said, on Nunez. So I just thought that's, that's where I would commit my, most of my first spends. And I'm going to fade more of O'Malley, although I'll have like probably like half the field, maybe a third the field on him. Um, and then I'm focusing on Burns and Menafield more. Burns, Bird, and Menafield more than the uh, than the Stammen. I'm sorry, the O'Malley, Stammen, and Nunez at the top, just in terms of pricing. Um, so that's sort of what I'm doing. And then I am going to play about 25% each. They won't all be together, uh, but there will be a couple of them together with uh, Wineland and Spencer. 
I'm not playing a million lineups. I'm playing a decent percentage, but I, I want to take shots on things. Like, I know we're going to end up tying everybody. You know, I know everybody says all that stuff. I'm not trying to become a cash game player at MMA. Like I'm not a cash game player at everything else. I want to play tournaments and from everybody I've listened to pretty much, I don't think these things are as locks as nearly as much of locks as we're treating them or, or as the, the betting will treat them as being. Um, so that's just where I'm sort of winding up here and paying down a little bit, taking as a slightly lower owned high, uh, high price guys, and then just going all the way down and, and taking shots on the, the two lowest priced, lowest owned players. Yeah. So, so a couple of other, I guess, opinions that I kind of, another way I kind of uh, broke these things down is that I compared guys with similar win odds relative to their, um, whether to their salaries. I mean, these are just kind of like ways that I just kind of thought about this. Like, and, and, and the, the one that kind of stood out for me is this Magni against Martin. All right. So you have Magni against Martin, but neither of them are going to be owned. Right. Um, that, that, that popular. And you have basically, I don't want to say a pick Yeah. They have like Magni, like minus minus one forty, which to me is like no big deal. Right. He's very, very small favorite over him, but he's, a full 1200 more as far as salary goes. Mm -hmm. So maybe Martin at 7,500 and, and you compare Martin to some of the other 7,500 guys. Um, I felt as though his win odds were just very, very comparable. Like you take him compared to this uh, Caceres, right? So Caceres is, is 7,700 compared to Martin 7,500. Caceres is a, like a 150 underdog, Right. Or 190 to 150 underdog. So again, I, I'm just I'm just looking for anything where I can get some relative value, and not to mention the fact that I didn't hear a single person recommend Martin. So that that got to help a little bit. So 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 between like these 7,500 guys, I'm I'm hearing this Caceres get like a little bit of steam because like here's here's one thing you look at is you can look at basically all the fights of these guys online. If you look at if you look at Hooper, he looks like this kind of like young kind of rash kid or whatever it is. And and Caceres is like this is is this veteran who whatever it is so uh, I can see why Caceres is getting a little bit of um, a little bit of steam I guess but the fact is is that compared to somebody like Martin I think that I would rather play Martin at similar salary with simply better win odds you know so again these are these are just my own again you can go crazy you know trying to trying to come up with with different ways to do it but but that that's and that's another thing that I kind of looked at. So here's another strategy. I actually am doing a little bit of a script this week, and I think that it's very important. So not one of my lineups will have all my salary use. I'm going to set it. I'm not, I'm not going to go crazy like some other people are setting it. So I'm going to set a range of 46.5 to 49.8. Just to yeah. try to differentiate any way I possibly can. Anytime these tiebreaker things come down, and you can ask the showdown guys who are excellent at this, Trying to find those differences are huge. Now, if I really had the, the guts, maybe I would go 49K as a maximum and, not, and always leave one K minimum on the table. That might be an interesting way to go. Um, I don't want to just – I'm trying to win still, so I'm, and I'm figuring it out. So I'm going to try this first. And um, from everybody I've talked to, uh, all my friends in the industry, they all agree that leaving money on the table is one of – it's, it's one of the most important sports, if not the most important, to actually always leave money on the table. So this is, this is my thought, and I think about this a lot, and, and literally every slate that I've played since COVID started, right, which means that we're dealing with all of these short slate sports, whether it be MMA or even LOL or, or NASCAR, all of them with like very limited combinations, right? Every single one of them, I, I, I do a salary, I, I, I leave salary, and um, I'm actually a lot more vicious when it comes to that than, than you are like I I, yeah, I told you I'm sort of toe dipping in here yeah I mean like I and this is the way I do like like I've I've done as much as you know 40 like max 48 8 you know what I mean I've tried I've tried everything you know but but and I, I, I have no problem with it and and this is what I like to do though what I like to do is I use whatever optimizer there is right whether it's the Roto Grinders one or, or fantasy Critter, whatever it is and what I'll do is I'll run scripts with a, let's say, a, a 50,000 max, for example, right? And then what I'll then I'll see what, you know, my average score is. And then what I'll do is I'll run the same script, excuse me, but with a 48.8 um, max, 
and then I'll see like, what am I costing myself? You know what I mean? Like, like if there's a huge difference between my 48 eights and my 49, five, 49 sixes, then maybe, you know, I've been a little bit too a bit rash about it. But if the, but if the difference is only, you know, a couple of points, right. Then I will be have no problem just to, you know, for, for the purposes of, of getting unique lineups, just taking, you know, eating, eating those, what did I say? I used to say, man, it's been so long since we did this, right? I, I didn't mind taking some projection risk, let's put it that way, um, and uh, a, a, in, in the name of being unique. So I'm, I'm with you with the, with the uh, obviously, with the salary on the table. It's just a question of, um, of how much. Like, if you leave, I know, if you leave 48000 on the table, I, I would play around, like, see what it gets you. You know what I mean? There, there are a lot of fights here that, I, that it could go either way, Right. Right. Um, that's what I, that's, that's what, that's why I'm with it. And I think that's a smart thing to do. And it's, you know, I'm also not planning on playing like the huge buy-ins for this thing. Like if I was playing the 555 or something, I think, which I probably will at some point, but probably not going to start, not going to start off with it. I don't think, um, I probably would be less open to doing this. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, so, I, so trying to win against 5 million people trying to beat a few hundred is a very different story. All right. So here, so here's another, uh, here's another, uh, quote unquote pick for you. And this is, this is, this is, this is the way Eric's brain works. Right. So again, I've, I've seen, I don't know, a zillion hours of, not a zillion hours of content, but I've seen maybe like five, six hours of content on this different guys from different sites, from different, whatever. And what I've been unable to find yet is someone who will recommend Sterling over Sandhagen. Okay. I don't know one this one guy from the other. Except I heard that San Diego was supposed to be really good or whatever. The fact of the matter is, is that they're both minus one ten. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, so I, 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 I'm just, just so into just taking Sterling just, just because of that. Um, and uh, kind of respecting Vegas, you know what I mean? Over, over yeah. what, what just appears right with, with the DFS providers and a DFS opinion. So that's another one that I'm kind of, so. But, I've looked at a few projected ownerships today though, and he's, he's projected to be owned. A, a oh, Sterling? Sterling, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe, maybe again, maybe because I don't know, but he's even more, he's even a higher price too. Yeah. Um, now, which is the guy who is the former champion? Is that Garbrandt? I don't, you're losing me here. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I, so, because he, this is another guy who I, I kind of like. I like the uh, Asun Asuncio a little bit because whenever, 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 again, whenever you can fade, like popular opinion, you know what I mean. It's usually a decent idea. So, like, somebody very smart was was saying that you know a lot of this comes, you know, a lot of uh, MMA comes down not so much numbers but somewhat narrative street. So for me, I kind of go a second second wave of that. Is the narrative is that easy to tell? I'll probably fade the narrative. You know what I mean? So, like, for example, there was, there was a guy who was the – got to figure this out. But we almost had, like, a lock uh, going into tomorrow. There was, a, there was the hanish Mearshart fight. Like, Hanish was, was going to drop out because I think somebody from his corner was, uh, uh, had coronavirus. So they were they – were, but, 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 you know, MMA, they, they, they throw caution when they don't care. Yeah. Um, so, so he's, he's going to end up coming back. Um, and I was, I was, so I was wondering how I felt about that. Like if the guy is, uh, I don't know, like, well, Mearshart may be kind of like, okay, I was thinking I was going to fight this guy. Then they told me I wasn't going to fight him. I'm going to fight him. He might be, I don't know. I, I might, maybe, maybe I won't be playing him. You know, maybe his brain's a little bit screwed up. Um, but I don't know. I, I think that, I think that you're on to something with the, uh, with the leading, leading salary on the table here. And picking, like you said, I mean, you're 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 into Menafield and Bird as your two kind of main guys, and and I the good thing is I, I, I think do, Burns actually I would have ahead of Bird personally. Menafield, who which one ahead of Bird? Burns. Burns. Okay, so tell me about him. So he's not the so yeah now he's not the same dude that 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 was really good in the in the last. I think he's his brother or something. No, it's, well Dunham, you know he. I think it is. Oh yeah, his brother. Maybe it is. I can't remember, man. Yeah, his brother did well the other day. So here's the thing that. So again, here's the thing that concerns me about Burns. So Burns, I mean, like he's played. Dunham is basically. I think he's been on a layoff 
for yeah, he's he's basically done with his career, and there everybody thinks he should stop fighting. From what I hear, right. So so my question is then: so why is he only like plus one eighty? Because the, because he's the experienced fighter against a wild okay. somewhat. But when you get that win, you you might get it in pure domination, right away. Okay. So okay. I think that's why that's sort of why I've sort sided a little bit more that way. And just that from the from the again the people I've talked to, they just felt that. Dunham really, it would take a, a very, very strange occurrence for him to have a, f a chance to really win this fight and more likely than not that Burns was going to get him early. That's what I, that's just what I got. And again, it's not that Burns is going to be unowned, but if I take the Menafield burns combo as my core of upper spend and leave Nunez out of those and leave Nunez and O'Malley out, I'm already different at least somewhat. And then I'm going to throw in one cheapo into most of those lineups. All of a sudden, I'm, that's just not a three-man combination that everybody's going to be able to have. You know, you know what you could do, Bobby, which I think maybe combines some of the things we talked about together? So what you could do is if you assume that Nunez is, is literally the most popular of them all, um, and who's the second most? Probably O'Malley? I would imagine. Based yeah. on the odds, I would bat at just O'Malley. So, so what I would do is, is if you play Nunez and O'Malley together, those would be the ones where I would set like a max, like even like 48-3. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if you're going to play the two most populars, then then you could differentiate the rest by, yeah, you could take big long shots also, but also you could differentiate with just salary. Um, so that that is definitely something that you could do, is it, it do a combination of, of salary withholding and also, you know, just own, making sure that the most popular, you know, the ones you have the – the, the two chalk guys on top, like Nunez and O'Malley, those are the ones that you leave the most off the, on the table. So, right. like, if you have lineups where, like, for example, if you toss out Nunez and O'Malley, then I think you're, that you'll be cool. If you could play, you could fill out almost your, your whole card. You know, you put in Bird, Menafield, Burns, right, like you said, and a couple of other decent guys. and Spencer in there and pivot to another spend-up. Yeah. They can both win. You just need your, person, your winner to outscore the other one. And yeah. the interesting thing about the way that scoring seems to be in this game is that, like, you see everybody's projections. Theoretically, if, if, a, if a win really means that much, someone should have nearly double the projections of someone else. All the projections are fairly close with all the players. It's just an interesting thing to point out for me as an outsider just moving in. Like, in other DFS sports where they're, you're, they're all projected this close, I would just say blindly, like baseball, just play the guys who aren't going to be owned. <laughs> like... But, that, but that's but but you know you laugh, but that's that's not even funny. You know what I mean? That that that's like mathematically just a hundred percent clear. You know what I mean? Um, you know when you when you have guys that 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 are even remotely close, that's why baseball is what it is. You know, like if you have you have two hitters. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever. Just think about um, like this for me. So this is what what I'm having trouble grasping onto. Every other sport we do, every single other sport that we do, and it's not even close. Almost always the projections line up in relation to projected ownership. It's incredibly rare that it doesn't happen. Right. So when you have a sport where it goes exactly the opposite, <laughs> right. it just seems like, okay, well, just play those guys then. They're actually projected better. You know, like I know it's a weird way to look at it, but it's like, it's, a, it's, it's what I'm having trouble getting past. And maybe I'll learn more as I, as I keep digging. But the people I've talked to and the things I've looked into, this doesn't seem to be far off from – a, look, a potential to lose that week, sure. Going to happen more often than not if you're going to be doing what I'm talking about. But when you hit, you're going you're to have chances for unique lineups and chances to hit big if you, if you pair these really, really low-owned guys together, especially because the projections are so similar on a point-per-dollar basis than the top guys or the middle guys, everybody. Yeah, so, so here's the thing. I, there's been a little bit of talk about whether um, um, projections, I don't want to say matter, but whether you should be relying on projections because of, um, well, number one, sample size is kind of rough because these guys don't fight too often. And number two, the, the theory is, is that so much of this is kind of, is kind of style based that how you're going to do against like a grappler is just not going to, is not going to translate to how you do a guy against who's like a boxer or whatever it is. Right. Um, but, but, but the one thing that I still go back to are these, are these Vegas odds, right? Cause the Vegas odds, and the Vegas props really take all that into account. So, like again, I, I, if all if all four of those fights that I mentioned are both very similar props with with under one and a half rounds, 
I may as well take the least popular of those. Right. So, so that, that, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And it's funny. I don't know if you're going to watch this, but it's a, it's a really bizarre sweat because unless you really know how the scoring works, like if you follow it, the get, final be over. Okay. So how many points did I get? And the way they update is really weird. Like they give you a little bit of it. Like they say, okay, you won. So you get this. And then they like come back and then they tell you how many strikes you got. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like they put like, they put a score up and they put another score up. It's, it's, if you're an expert, you obviously know probably right off the bat how many points you have. But um, the other thing that's kind of cool is that, is that the way you can follow along is, look, you, you said that well, maybe there's a chance that you could hang in there if you have Spencer and maybe still be alive. I still think you do have to win probably all six of your guys. You know what I mean? So, and then, so it's great. Like, so when, when, when one guy's out, then you just don't have to look at that lineup anymore. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's going to be, uh, there's got to be know. exceptions to this chief. There's got to be exceptions to it. Yeah, I guess so. There's got to be times where it happens. I mean, I don't know all the detailed scorings for a lot of these other things like League of yeah. Legends, but I was watching people win tournaments where they were getting like zeros in their captain spot. Like things didn't make any sense. Really? Yeah. It was like, so I need to do, do more research on this. I'm not sitting here as an expert of this yet. What we did hopefully yeah. help talk about yeah. it, ways to build lineups, ways to think, you know, in terms of trying to be game theory optimal rather than, you know, w without understanding all the details, you can still play from a mathematical standpoint with an advantage, um, even in sports you don't necessarily know about. Now, obviously it will help the more and more we learn. And Sheets did point out some good things. We both done some, you know, digging up on uh, what other people think, but like, we will fine tune this. We'll get this stuff to you guys in a form where we understand it even more than we do now or a lot more than we do now. But uh, for right now, hopefully we just talked a little bit about, you know, maybe ways to construct lineup and gave you guys some ideas. Feel free to give us feedback on this, by the way. And uh, we're going to keep it coming before, until our uh, real sports come up, which is thankfully happening really soon. So Sheets, any thoughts before we get out of here or anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess one other thing I should mention is, is again, we're not going to really talk about too much about how to play MMA, but, one of the, just so you guys know, I mean, for those of you who are following, the reason why, one of the reasons why the Nunez Spencer, the Nunez is going to be so, so popular is, yeah, she's probably, you know, she's a great fighter. But whenever you have the main event, so the main event usually has five rounds compared to three for the other, for the other fights. So that's why the main events are always really popular because, you know, you just have the opportunity to, to pile on more points or whatever it is. So um, but nonetheless, that's all kind of factored in, right? It's all factored into the price. It's all factored into the ownership or whatever it is. And, you know, if you're alive into that last fight, man, I tell you, man, if I'm within, if I pile up some points with, with, with O'Malley or Bird or Manyfield, I have no problem. Like if you sit with my Spencer lineup, just hoping for some freaking flu captains, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and it's, it's also kind of cool when you're doing this, that you can, you already know going into that last fight whether you had a chance. So it's not like – it's kind of like – I don't know. It's kind of like when you have that last guy in the NBA in the, in the, in the late-night hammer game, and you know it's that one guy who needs a certain amount of points. The, the good thing about it is you really know going into that last fight whether you have a chance, what you need, and, and whatever. So um, I will say this. God forbid one of our lineups has a shot, even with like two or three fights left, I mean, you're, you're going to hear from us on the live stream. That I promise you. That's for sure. And uh, one other thing I just wanted to add to that is we do have, like, so if you leave, you can late swap on DraftKings here, right? No. Oh, okay. My bad then. I thought you could late swap up to the last fight. That I don't was, believe There goes that last point I was going to make. All right. Well, anyway, guys, hopefully we were helpful. It's really good to be back with you guys. We got golf coming up next week. We've got NASCAR coming up. And uh, then we've got basketball in just about six weeks. We can start talking about it. Um, all right, guys. Anyway, thanks for tuning in. Uh, for Sheets, I'm Bobby. We're out of here. We'll talk to you soon.